Okay, well, welcome to all uh, in this room and also uh, online, uh, because it is also retransmitted online, this conference. So thanks to all to, to come uh, to TUNE. I think we have about 250 people announced to the meeting and hope we will have a, a very nice discussion uh, with people from a lot of different fields here. So I welcome you in the name of the Swiss National Foundation. I'm Nicolas Rodon, the delegate of the research Council in the NRP 78. If you look at the program, it was planned that it should be Gudela, uh, uh, who should be, have been here for uh, the presentation, but she cannot uh, come today, so uh, I replace her for this welcome uh, talk. So um, it's uh, the first large conference that is directly organized by the Swiss National Foundation with a very large interdisciplinary group uh, merging these two NRPs, the 78 and the 80, and also the special call. And I hope we will have a very good discussion. It already started yesterday on the research findings, the lessons of the pandemic, and the challenges for the future. Uh, so as you could see in the program, a lot of different uh, formats. So we have a keynote speeches, project, poster presentation and parallel uh, thematic session and panel discussion, there is one tonight, and a lot of workshop. Just a summary for those who don't know, there, there was a very large funding and a very quick funding from the Swiss National Foundation for the COVID pandemic, so already in March 22, huh, quite early after the start of the pandemic in Switzerland, there was a special call uh, with the aim to better con uh, understand uh, the virus, the spread, the illness, the diagnosis and the treatment in order to deal more effectively with the pandemic. About 36 research projects and four implementation projects were funded with a budget of 10 million. Just after April 2020, there was a decision to launch another NRP. I think start, uh, the funding was uh, uh, beginning of August. And here it goes a, a bit deeper to better understand the COVID-19 epidemic, also get some clinical recommendation uh, for the care of patients and how to address public health response with also the goal to quickly develop some vaccines and treatment and a better diagnostic. It was 28 research projects, seven implementation projects with a budget of 20 million. And then a bit later, so starting today, because it's a kickoff meeting, so this was a, the two other call as a very special process so that they were very quickly launched and very quickly uh, funded, so within some months for the NRP 78, which was challenging also to find all the experts. So NRP 80, it goes with the usual way, so a bit longer with a lot of consultation of a lot of people in Switzerland, also the different offices in, in uh, by the Federal Council. And so uh, this one starts today. It involves mainly the humanities and the social science with a start uh, so in December and the kickoff uh, kick meeting today. And here the goal is to understand the societal dimension of the pandemic, better knowledge, how to proactively manage, uh, better manage uh, future uh, pandemics. And there are 25 research projects with a budget of 14 million. So today, uh, as mentioned, we try to, to have all together, so the people from the special call on COVID, from the NRP 78, and at the same time, the kickoff meeting of 80, with the goal also to have some inter interdisciplinary dialogue on the, the, this pandemic and try to better make research all together to address uh, these challenges. We have also invited people from other domains so, uh, to join, so from InnoSuisse, SNF, and also there are some AU-related projects to, to COVID. Uh, this is done in, with partner institutions with InnoSuisse and representative of the federal administration, and we hope we will have some echo in the media. This is a live stream presentation, so not all, but the keynote speeches, the wrap-ups uh, of the two president uh, lectures, 
and the panel discussion will be transmitted uh, via live stream and will be accessible for those who might miss some part of the conference on the SNF YouTube channel. So these are the rules. I didn't know about that, but it seems a good rule, hopefully. Uh, so anyone is free to use information from the discussion, uh, but it is not allowed to mention who made any comment. And the idea is to be able to increase the openness of the discussion, which was a very important topic uh, in this pandemic. I think uh, Professor Samia Earth will likely speak about uh, also communication in one of the next talk. I want uh, to thank the people of the steering committees. This is the 78. They were extremely busy at the beginning with a lot of projects that we have to decide in uh, the middle of the summer and then just quickly after which project will be funded and how to, to uh, help this project uh, to have the best result. Also the president who is also here, uh, Marcel Salate, perhaps I will not read all the names uh, for a matter of time, but I thank them all. Also some are here today to, to comment and also make the discussion uh, in the different uh, working group. I want also to thank the steering committee. This one, it is mainly the work, so it was already a lot of work to, to, uh, to choose and select the project, but now also a lot of work to, to follow the different projects, try to make the best of the funding that was uh, given to this project. And there is also some interconnection uh, between the two uh, uh, NRPs, so the 78 and the 80, also with uh, Professor Hanlis Wilder Smith, who is in both committee, to have a good connection between the two calls. So I want to thank you all for the great research find findings. Some were presented uh, yesterday, some will be presented in the today and tomorrow, and all the great projects that we receive at the Swiss National Foundation. As always, not all projects could be funded. I hope uh, we selected the best one and the other one could find other possibility for funding. And I hope for uh, an excellent discussion uh, in the next two coming days. Uh, and I want to, again, to thank you all uh, for your work in the name of the Swiss National Foundation. Thank you. All right, good morning. Thank you um, for this introduction, Nicola. Welcome also from my side. Um, those who are new here today, welcome. We had a fantastic day yesterday, I think. Um, already a lot of interdisciplinary uh, discussions. Today is completely uh, under the banner of inter and transdisciplinarity. As a 78, we're particularly looking forward to today as well. As you know, we are finishing and um, we will deliver, of course, a final report to the Federal Council. And at that point, um, we will, of course, um, talk about all the fantastic work that has been done. But we would also like the opportunity to reflect a little bit, right, and the learnings that we had from this pandemic for a next one. And that's what the sessions are also a bit designed for. And I encourage you to really think broadly and think freely, of course, as always, um, and not just of another COVID pandemic, but rather of a disease X pandemic. And um, I sometimes try to think, you know, what would the pandemic look like if it were caused by a fungus, for example? I mean, I watch probably too many um, sci-fi movies, but it helps me a little bit to get out of that uh, box thinking and see, okay, what are the generalities we can take over from this pandemic to the next one that's not COVID? And another thing we want to really know is, for science more broadly, um, are things that we've learned uh, from doing science in this extreme crisis mode, are they transferable to another non-infectious uh, disease crisis? And if so, how and why so, why not, and so on. So, yeah, put your thinking hats on. I mean, you ha always have them on, your scientists, but even more so today. Good. So with that, I would like to introduce the first keynote speaker, Lone. Simonsen Lone is um, a Danish epidemiologist. She's now in Denmark, but she actually spent most of her career in the US. Um, you had stints pretty much everywhere, uh, at the CDC, at the NIH for a long time. You spent some time at the WHO. Right. Then she had an appointment um, at the 
uh, George Washington University, and then a co-appointment in Denmark. I imagine that was complicated. Um, and then, but four <laughs> years or five years ago, you um, finally moved back to Europe for good. And you're now in Denmark at the Roskilde University, where you're the director of the Pandemics Center, uh, which is also thinking about pandemic preparedness. Right. And what makes your work so interesting, f apart from having done really key seminal contributions to epidemiology is also that Lona has um, uh, always looked at the historical angle. She was the scientific face of Corona in Denmark, uh, which gave her the nice nickname Corona Lona, Yay. which I think is very cute. <laughs> so without further ado, thanks so much for coming. Well, thank you, Marcel. That was lovely. <laughs> Well, it is a great pleasure to be here and, and uh, have a chance to uh, speak about my favorite topic of all things, which is really uh, pandemics of the past and the present and with an eye towards the future. And because the next speaker will cover uh, bioethics and the humanities aspects of this, um, I'm going to call this one uh, a Reflections of an Epidemiologist and uh, try to tell you some of the thinking and some of the work that we have done before this pandemic and then afterwards. Um, after having sat through a session yesterday afternoon, I realized you're just so cool here in Switzerland, you actually have realized that, that uh, pandemiology, as we could call it, if we really want to understand this concept of pandemics, we have to be extremely interdisciplinary. We have to really um, incorporate various research fields uh, because all of us have a chunk of this animal. I know a lot about the, the tufts maybe of this uh, animal here and somebody else has got the tail, but all together we can stitch this together and understand how best to defend uh, humanity against it and how to best survive it as a population afterwards. Um, so we in our department has a lot of uh, math and epidemiology, sort of the quantitative end, but uh, I should tell you that three of my PhDs right now and uh, postdocs are actually historians. So I'm really, I'm trying to live this, that I'm not just saying it. Um, we're really stretching to find synergy uh, and all of this in the interest of preparing uh, for the future disease X, which is another severe pandemic of the future. So this is the center that I'm, I have here. I should say that uh, it's in collaboration. All that you hear here is, is work of my great people at the uh, Roskilde University, Niels Bohr Institute, at the University of Copenhagen, the Danish Technical University, and the North Zealand Hospital. And uh, we're just trying to, uh, we set out, we got this big uh, Center of Excellence grant to map the pandemic signatures. What can we really say about all the pandemics that went before in terms of how did they, like a fingerprint, imprint on the uh, human population? And um, I just like to think of it as a new field, pandemiology, why not? Um, and so, to begin with, um, what, if you really think about it from the point of view of a virus uh, or another pathogen, the trick is really to be able to make it a sustained transmission in, in the, when you cross over, and this is how pandemics uh, are born, really, from animal reservoirs, uh, zoonotic diseases, they, may, they cross over, uh, they rare, the random veterinarian gets infected, and maybe he infects his wife or something, but really it stays lurking, it doesn't have yet what it takes to spread effectively in the human population, and, and I just drew several un, uh, unsuccessful attempts there. Um, I can't really do this. No, never mind. Um, but uh, one of them, the, one, the long one here, went all the way in several generations of transmission and managed to learn the trick to transfer effectively amongst people. And in this example, um, it, it, everyone who's infected uh, infects about two people, and therefore the transmission uh, constant or whatever, the r not that you're probably all familiar with after this pandemic, uh, is uh, two. That means it will spread exponentially to, uh, through a population if you do nothing to stop it. And uh, two is not a crazy idea. Um, in uh, both the uh, 1918 pandemic flu was about uh, two to three, this, uh, this figure. And for COVID 2019, the original variant uh, was about the same order of magnitude. So this is a really important thing. Of course, the other one is how long does it take to get from generation to generation? And that is, um, for flu, a very short interval, just a couple of days. Um, for for uh, COVID, it was a bit longer in the beginning, but that has been shortening throughout, and that's probably why we see this mess of Omicron variants right now spreading uh, like crazy. 
Um, to uh, just give you an idea of where, where all this started, we, we, um, the first thing I did when I was at the NIH and the CDC was to try to figure out, can we study even these pandemics from 100 years ago? And back then, around uh, what, the end of the 1990s, it was, there wasn't really that many data anywhere. But by wo starting working with historians, we, we actually managed to, to really do uh, studies. Several people start doing this thing. It's like a, a new thing whatever. And we, and we, in the field of epidemiology, managed to really uh, study the Spanish flu especially. Uh, and, and that's really the mother of all pandemics. It came from a bird somewhere, probably in Asia, definitely a bird. We know that from genetic studies. And it spread and probably in today's population would have caused 75 million deaths, mostly of young adults. That was the, the sort of horrible thing about that pandemic. Then you had the next two ones in 57 and 68, also with uh, parts of of their genome coming from uh, birds and the uh, lesser impact uh, these are sort of thought of as moderate pandemics but nevertheless there they were and that kind of was the stage as it was set for pandemic planning as Marcel was mentioning we sort of were very myopic in our way of thinking about this all the, the world was really waiting for was a new influenza A pandemic of this kind and all eyes were directed towards Asia and birds and 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 then Something else happened. Suddenly we had in 2003 a major pandemic threat, a coronavirus of all things, um, from, uh, from, from, uh, uh, that, we co that got the name SARS, was our first meeting with highly deadly coronaviruses. And, and that one was eradicated that same year by, um, by actually, it, it was surprising because it really transmitted quite well. It had also an R naught of two to three there in the beginning, but it was ended um, from some kind of combination of contact tracing and, and something I'll be speaking to you about a little bit later, which is the heterogeneity that not everyone transmitted the same with this virus. Then we came in uh, 2009, and, and while everybody's looking in Asia for, for, for bird flu, um, instead we had the swine flu epidemic starting in Mexico, and that was really, really a mild one. And I think also this is important to understand our mindset going into the coronavirus pandemic. That was our meeting with, uh, that's our last pandemic experience globally, and it was mild. It was like nothing more in terms of deaths than, the, uh, than a seasonal flu would be, um, and, and people just like, is that all it is? We're just like so superior now with our economy and our great uh, health sectors. We don't have to worry too much about this. We got this. It's just more a problem for, for low-income countries. And then in the, we also had a second threat with, uh, with coronaviruses there in uh, MERS, also not a pandemic, but definitely a threat. Both of these were probably the most, the SARS, I was working on the outbreak in 2003, is the most scary thing I've ever done in my career. And many people don't remember it maybe, but I certainly do because 10% of the people we knew were, that were infected would have died from it. And for MERS, it was much higher than that. So there was really a whole other ballpark of, uh, of, of scary. Fortunately, it didn't make pandemics. And then in 2019, with COVID, we have just been through this first uh, successful coronavirus uh, ever. Um, and it was less deadly, but because so many people were infected, the total death toll is huge. It's actually, in, in terms of, if you just count uh, how many deaths were reported by PCR testing, seven, eight million, I don't remember what the number is right now. But more importantly, if you look at excess mortality, which is a better way to find everybody who died of this, it's probably more like 20 million people who died of this. So what can we know about, what can we learn from all of these past experiences? Is really, there's, there's one good news piece that I often talk about in, in the, when people are too depressed about all of this is, well, they always end. It takes like two to five years, a couple of waves, and then it will end with uh, immunity. That's at least something we can know. And we also know that we're, not, we're gonna live with this. We're gonna, uh, uh, corona has so much, COVID has so much in common with, uh, with the pandemics of the past that it'll end the same way. We're going to have winter seasonal epidemics and that's going to be its endemicity, the way we're going to live with it going forward. So um, now we're just waiting for this future disease X and, and all of you I can see are not terribly old. You will experience more pandemics in your lifetime. There's no doubt about it. The question is, are you going to experience more of these hundred years events that the COVID and the uh, Spanish flu were? So I'll, sp I'll tell you a little bit about the 1918 mother of all pandemics that uh, really was my first go at this. What can we, how can we study its signature? How can we understand? How can I find this virus? In, in, how can I find this pandemic in lesser data? 
And this is the work we did in 2008 with uh, Cecile Vibu at the NIH and uh, two of my colleagues at the, uh, at the center here. Um, we, we discovered, if you look at time series of all deaths, uh, from 10-year period here, you will see that it was only the, the uh, young adults who were at an extreme risk. And one thing we noted at the time was that there was absolutely no excess mortality, no rise in, in mortality at all in the people over 45. And we start worrying about wh what was that all about? Why was it so much the young adults? Why were the elderly spared? And um, again, this pandemic lasted. You can see the, 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 there's actually four waves in, in this period from 1918 to 1922. And, um, and we made this hypothesis of why were the elderly spared? Maybe it was something they had experienced in their childhood that actually saved them in the, going into their uh, next pandemic. And um, so we, we did something fun with the, we, with the um, we were able to study and find a mild summer wave in 1918 where um, many people were infected, especially in Nordic countries and in, uh, in, in England and other places. It was like quite widespread, but the, the case fatality rate was 0.3%, not really a lot at the time. A few excess deaths, so, so people were writing in newspapers, physicians would write, nothing to worry about, just go about your business as always. But then in the fall wave came this uh, dramatic mother of all pandemic event, where the uh, case fatality rate uh, got up to 2.1%, and you had like 2 million uh, whatever, 20 million people at the time dying, 75% in today's numbers. Um, that was really a six-fold worse uh, uh, mortality rate in the second wave than the first one. So that's, uh, that's interesting, isn't it? That, that was also something one can know from historical pandemics. It doesn't always have to be nicer over time. Sometimes it can get worse. It's not, it's, it's not I don't know how you're going to act on information like that. Should you go and get infected in the first wave or what? But uh, you could think about that. Um, the reason we could find this one, because it was a really uh, very small and, and not very uh, clear what it was, was that after the deaths that happened, in both waves, 95% of them were under 65 years of age, to 20 to 40 years of age, really. And that is uh, significantly, that's indicative of it being the uh, Spanish flu. So we have uh, coined that was a first wave of this. And also its transmissibility of over two, which we could measure from its, uh, its curves, um, was indicative of it being a pandemic wave. So really we have seen here a first wave being sixfold milder. We have seen cross protection. I don't have time to show you this, but in another study we demonstrated that if you had gotten flu in the first wave, you were as protected in the major wave as you would if you had a modern vaccine. Um, Later on, nobody of the virologists would believe us because we're just epidemiologists talking about statistical things. But finally, somebody found the virus in the summer um, uh, and uh, it's a Taubenberger's group and they, and they actually managed to say, yes, it was true, the virus was there. And in a new European archival study, um, they've actually noticed that, yes, they could also find the virus in the first and the second wave and see the mutations that are probably causing this difference in the, uh, in the mortality in the two waves. So the other question that's really like haunting me to this day, and it will probably continue to, is why is it that people over exactly 20 years of age were at the highest risk in the uh, 1918 mortality. And really, when you think about it, if you're 28 in, 18, in, in uh, 1918, you are born around 1892. That is the Russian flu pandemic. So it, it, it begs the question, had they experienced something that made them at extra high risk when in their, in their priming years of uh, flu? Or, or what's really going on? And also, when you look at the elderly, um, the, the people born after um, 1860 or so, they really, uh, or before 1860, they had no problem at all with with this pandemic. So really, uh, taking this all together, we have some lessons that are maybe actionable, at least it's worth to know. Pandemics will occur every 20 years. Deadly pandemics maybe every 100 years. They come in waves. You can't just expect one major wave. For whatever reason, they tend to come in two to four waves. There's something about the first flu you experience, um, and there could be protection from previous pandemics. And really the way we saw this loud and clear was in the 2009 pandemic, where people could, again, it happened that only people over 
uh, under 60 years of age were uh, likely to die from that. The elderly were spared. But that time, you could actually look at data from blood uh, that was harvested, that, that was taken in 2008 before the pandemic, and you could see they already had the protective antibodies in their blood, the people who are 60 years and older. So now it's not, no longer a hypothesis. We know there's something about, something you can carry over time that matters in the future. First, waves can be um, maybe milder, they can also be more severe, but uh, in, in two of the pandemics we've studied, it was actually milder at first and later. And then eventually you would come to herd immunity, ex a lot of immunity in the population, and they would go over to be seasonal epidemics. Um, so uh, th that's, if you ask most experts, they will say that's how it will end, we'll have winter epidemics of COVID. And, and I think really my best uh, evidence of this is really comes from another uh, coronavirus in the same family, beta coronavirus family, which is called OC43 and causes your children and grandchildren to uh, be, uh, get, a, get the cold in the winter. They're winter epidemics, uh, they must have been a pandemic uh, sometime earlier. Um, and, and therefore, we sort of have already observed the end game of a coronavirus. Now uh, we have COVID-19 uh, declared a pandemic, March 11, 2020, our world's changed. Um, and, and I just wanted to give you an idea about how we were thinking about control, because it was really very murky thinking when you, when you look at it. In the, first, we had the WHO advice. Uh, uh, to test and test and test, and I think really what they had in their mind was SARS from 2003. If you find all the cases and you track them down and you isolate them, you can stop this again. And, and it really was uh, probably not uh, advisable because it already had some, some, some characteristics that, that it would not make this possible, I'll show you in a bit. The other idea was the, um, comes actually from 1918 pandemic, that you can, instead of having a mean uh, red, nasty wave of, of mortality you can, uh, and morbidity, you can spread it out by, by doing something, by mitigating it in various ways, and you can get this pretty green wave instead. And that was sort of um, the, the thinking, at least in Denmark, I think many places, let's keep this low to make it so that the health system can survive this threat, not, so that all, not all our hospital beds will be full of people. But what uh, SARS was different, as it turns out, from, from, uh, from, uh, from SARS-CoV-2 in, in 2019 was so different from SARS in 2003 for two major reasons. And that really explains why 2003 virus could be eradicated that same year, while this one went on to cause a major pandemic. And the trick one is really that infectiousness begins uh, two days before symptom onset. If I, I can infect somebody else without even knowing I have the disease. And trick two is really that, that many never develop any symptoms, yet they can transmit it to other people. So this is information we had very early on, and it made me think that really what we have is a, a virus that, that can go under the radar, very different from, from SARS in 2003, much more like the pandemic flus that we have so much experience about. So um, then we set out for the green wave thing in, in uh, Denmark here, probably in many other countries. And what happened to our big surprise was we locked down in uh, March uh, 13, 2020. And instead of getting this green wave, instead we got this little yellow sort of flop thing. It, it just uh, really controlled whatever we were doing, totally controlled this pandemic, and it, it, uh, it knocked it down. We thought maybe it was the weather, maybe it was uh, something. We, didn't, we couldn't quite explain this, but it was, of course, a good thing. And after that, we, we dropped the red, cur red uh, green curve thinking and instead thought of it as a, as a, as a let's keep this R0, let's press it down to a, 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 a contact number below epidemic control, so below one. And that's really what um, I could call, a, we never really talked much about what this would, I would call it many small streams make a big river approach. You do a lot of things and all of them will contribute to epidemic control. So in Denmark, uh, we did all these things on the list here, and uh, probably did, most countries did. But we had un uh, an unusual hard focus on mass testing. And it really comes from this idea, why couldn't you go in and, and uh, find uh, cases really fast with antibody testing, and then pull them out of the infectious uh, pool, and that way uh, uh, get a lot more control over the epidemic. 
And actually, it turned out it was quite effective. We believe that, that uh, if you had just tested those people who were um, symptomatic, which meant most, co most countries did, you would have found the, the blue cases over time. But if you did the uh, PCR testing, you would have found the orange cases. And with the uh, antigen testing, we found the red cases. So really, most of the cases that were identified at any time could be told, uh, go home, stay out of circulation, and isolate yourself. And that way, we got a better epidemic control and from uh, doing some math on this we figured probably we could reduce transmission by 25 percent by this one thing and of course this was extremely expensive if you think about it every dane was tested uh, every 10 days and we had the corona pass requiring testing every three days if you want to go around in and all of this before we had the vaccine so really it's something to think about for the next pandemic was this uh, worth it was this uh, something that uh, and i can only say it worked from, a, from the health perspective, it worked. Was it worth it economically? That's another question. I don't think we are done with that one yet. Another uh, obvious question when you stand in front of a new pandemic threat is, of course, how deadly is it? It could be anywhere from mild, like a uh, 2009 pandemic, to really severe, like the 1918, or even worse, like the pandemics of the Middle Ages. So what's the, you could ask, what's the risk of dying? What's the excess mortality? What's the worst case scenario if I do nothing? And what's with this chronic long COVID anyway? And the reason, um, I just wanted to tell you, this is really a hard question, it sounds easy, but it's really difficult and it's, 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 um, it, it happened in the 2009 pandemic. Uh, the first assessments that appeared in science um, figured this pandemic was really severe, maybe somewhere in between 1957 and, 19, uh, and 1918, like really in the, high, high, in the red uh, part of the spectrum. And it turns out they were about 100-fold wrong, 100-fold wrong. So um, it really was quite a mild, but that's just hard to do because in the beginning you only see the severely ill people. You don't see all the people who have the infection. That takes some uh, blood donor uh, or serology studies to figure out who had the infection. Um, one other thing is that the, we very clearly found out that uh, the dominant mortality risk factor is old age. There's no doubt about this. You see this in many studies from China in the beginning and Italy and wherever this epidemic got a foothold, COVID, you would see this thing that being in old age is really bad for you. In, in Danish nursing homes, for example, we saw that elderly who were very frail, um, 90 years of age, could have a mortality risk as high as 30% if they were infected with this virus before the vaccines. And then you can, of course, say, well, it's just because old people have a lot of co comorbidities. But in this British study, they sort of sorted them out. It's, it's, a, it's, it's sort of controlling for all kinds of factors. I'm sorry, it's written in Danish here. But the, the gender, the, the BMI, the ethnicity, the, whether they had diabetes, all these things are now controlled for. And even so, being over 80 years of age is, is banging out in its own uh, league. It's simply age is the most important risk factor in this pandemic. And that's very different from the uh, past pandemics that we had observed with flu. Uh, it's something we have to understand is probably this pandemic was especially a threat for wealthy countries with an aging population. Another thing we saw that we hadn't really seen coming was the evolution of the SARS coronavirus um, to, uh, over time. We started with the original variant, then we got Alpha, then we got Delta, and now we have Omicron, this and that, and it just goes on and on. And, and it's, um, over time, the R0 of this virus increased. Uh, the, the Delta was uh, horrifying. It had a really high uh, R0 of 6 to 8, plus it was at, at twice the mortality risk as the original virus. That's not a good time. So that's another example of things getting worse over time. But now with the era of Omicron, where most people are vaccinated, or already immune, things are looking much different. But if you look at why should we worry about these are not, it's really because it determines how many people have to be infected before the, the infection will, will be done or the epidemic will be done. If you have an R0 of two and a half, maybe you need to get 60% infected before you have immunity. If you have an R0 like Delta of six to eight, you, you have to get all the way up to over 80% immunity before it will stop. And that's not the only factor um, to worry about. Also, you have to worry about the serial interval and the uh, degree of immune escape, which Omicron was the first uh, global variant to also be able to escape immunity. And, and therefore, um, that's one of uh, our PhD students is just trying to understand all these phenomena that's going there. But that was really a, a, a thing that made me think, ah, 
now I think I understand why there was waves in past pandemics. It probably was really uh, variants that were coming through and, uh, and doing their thing. We, I hadn't thought of it that way before. Now I have to go back and rethink the, um, when I look at the zero epidemiology studies from back then. The Omicron is really the time when, when uh, the Danes just let it go. We had excellent epidemic control in these two first waves up to the time where everybody was vaccinated and, so, and, and only 10% of Danes had ever had this uh, infection before uh, they were vaccinated. And then we just let all stops out. We just opened the society as one of the first countries in the world, I think. And we just said, okay, let it, there's nothing more we can do, right? We're all vaccinated. Uh, here's Omicron. It's no worse than the, the first one. And that's why that's when all the Danes got it. And from serology studies, uh, 70% or something like that had it in that way for the first time. And then you see that there was also some hospitalizations and deaths there. And of course, there's more because there was many more people getting infected. And that has been really hard to communicate because people are just like, wow, we just do all this and we do all the right things and then we have more deaths. How do you explain yourself? Stuff like that is what you, what you do on TV, try to, to make this uh, uh, understand that it was actually not so surprising that that happened. The vaccines were highly effective against severe COVID and it remains that way. And that's also uh, something that has really been misunderstood. Uh, in Denmark, we had an extremely high uh, uh, trust rate so that 95 of people over 80, uh, over 50 years of age actually got vaccinated with boosting and everything. So we really, really well protected. And if you look at the um, effect of the vaccination over time um, in, in, no, in different age groups, it was super high, much better than we could have hoped for. This is really the miracle of vaccination we are, we are witnessing here. And uh, we just do, did it on the surveillance data we had because we're testing so much in Denmark and, and we could really, um, and, and we know by CPR numbers who's gotten vaccine, we could just do this very easily in real time. So what's new about this pandemic is we can use a vaccine, it can be effective and we can study its effect in the original real time. That has never happened before, not even in the 2009 pandemic. <clears throat> Excess mortality is um as something that I've spent a lot of my career uh, working on because it's such an excellent way to look and compare severity over time. You, you, here you see the Euromomo surveillance system, which Switzerland is also a member of, and you can see the really across Europe, what, what does it look like when you have seasonal flu and what does it look like when you have COVID there? It's, a, it's some kind of combination of the infection fatality rate and then how many people have been infected. What's the, what's the chance of dying when you get the infection times how many people people were infected. And uh, that, if you do that kind of modeling for all kinds of countries, you will see that c countries fared very, very different. You have at the bottom here the cumulative excess mortality. Uh, countries in, in Scandinavia and, um, and uh, New Zealand, Australia, really low. And all in the top, you have countries uh, in the um, Eastern Europe. And here's Bulgaria just really banging out with an 1% of their population having died of, of coronavirus. And, and it's partly certainly due to them not wanting to have the vaccine. There was a lot of vaccine mistrust in Bulgaria and, and only 30% of people were vaccinated, including the physicians didn't want to take it. And, and so this is kind of what happened. It, it got really bad. You see Switzerland somewhere there uh, doing pretty well, but not uh, that you definitely had more uh, infection, people infected and lower uh, vaccination rates than we did in Scandinavia. And that shows up here in the total death toll that way. Now I want to get back to this surprise, this little yellow thing. How can we understand that we just got a little a yellow curve instead of this green wave in the beginning? And um, to, to understand this, you have to think about COVID, COVID super spreading, which we, you all remember right from the start. You had these outbreaks reported. Here's one from Switzerland. There was a, an infected bartender with a flute and there was a lot of people in the room. And what happened, um, it was a super spreader event due to a combination of a presence of someone who was infected, the behavior that spread it out in the room, and then a large crowd uh, ready to receive it. And actually, interestingly, uh, also 
Austria was not on the list of uh, countries that we uh, didn't that we tested for in the beginning of the pandemic, and most of the cases in Northern Europe is seeded from exactly that country. So uh, this was not trivial. This actually can can reflect uh, later on. But this was uh, very much called attention to by the uh, the Icelandic, who were very good in the start at, at sequencing uh, the pandemic because of their decode center. So they they called attention and said to the WHO, you should really look at Austria. But it took a while to, to get it to happen and to uh, react to it. But we thought, what can this really mean when you have super spreading? Could it be that it explains our ability to control COVID? So in the left picture, you have corona-like spread. The R0 is 2, the average is 2, that's true for, for transmission, but it's only some people who, who give most of the cases. Maybe 80% of the cases are, are caused by a few people. Um, in the other one, it's, it's just a very much more democratic. What could that mean in terms of uh, control? <laughs> yeah. Um, so in for corona, 10% of infected infect 80%. So we used an agent-based model to really understand what this was. And, and the idea of looking into this was not new. In the, it was thought about by his, uh, Mark Lipsitz and his team in, in 2003 during SARS. We really should try to understand this better. What's with the super spreading? It should co come into our models, but nothing happened. We have uh, 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 John, uh, James Lloyd here uh, looking at the phenomenon of super spreading and talking about a dispersion parameter. You can really call it something that is very super spreading organisms have a very low dispersion parameter. It's, a, it's how much a difference there are between people's chance of transmitting. So in one end you have SARS and the other end you have flu. There's something here we need to understand better. So we did this modeling and found out that if you put in a super spreading, in agent based model, if you did not add super spreading, you could uh, regulate uh, contacts in the, um, in, in, the, in the random space and not achieve very much. But if you put super spreading in the, in the model, you actually get this little yellow curve thing. You can really mitigate this completely just because when you actually go and, and, and reduce the contacts you have in the public space, in the metros, in the concerts and everything, you, you, you make this virus lose its cool because that's where it makes most of its transmission events. So that was really something we uh, actually have then uh, published and thought about really as the Achilles heel of the SARS coronavirus 2. Thank God we had the over dispersion, the super spreading, because it made it possible for us to control the virus until the, the vaccine became available. And also we had to think about, well, what does this mean in terms of airborneness? This obviously, if you can super spread in a whole room, it has to be in small air bubbles that float for a long time. That has simply, that thinking needs to be developed. Um, you could ask from a public health perspective, why did it take full two or three years to, for agencies like WHO and CDC to start talking about this being airborne? That really was uh, too long because we knew it already from the super spreading being so important. Um, and, uh, and that's just something we, we are just sorting that out in Denmark right now. How should, we, um, this, how should we talk about that and how should we go about improving air quality in the future for, for COVID but also for, also for other pandemic uh, for the epidemic diseases. So what will happen next? Well, globally, it's, it's, it looks like we're at the end of this pandemic. Everything is slowing down. We had a little uptick there when China um, <clears throat> opened up uh, their zero COVID uh, politics. But globally, overall, this is coming down. This is the mortality shown in six different uh, um, regions of the world. It's definitely going down. And I think we're definitely at the tail end of this thing. So the COVID end game. Um, we had to think about it like, well, we were lucky in some of the countries, like uh, in Scandinavia, certainly also to some extent in, in a country like Switzerland, most people got the vaccine first. And this virus will find everybody, so it's better to be meeting it with some vaccine protection because it will decouple the epidemic. It will make it so that, that yes, you can get infected, you may even uh, get sick, or you may even something, but you will not get hospitalized and die in the same way as you saw in my figure before. Your, your risk of that kind of thing drops to 10% or less. Um, then um, you also saw that most of us have, have managed to first get the vaccine and then get subsequently infected during the Omicron waves when you have the, the milder version of the virus that's more upper respiratory, uh, which really was a good thing. 
Um, I think this will end because of the combination of vaccines and, uh, and, and natural infection. You get this that's called hybrid um, super duper immunity kind of thing. You actually not only have antibodies that work, you also have your T cells, all the immune epitopes that work because now the immune system has seen the whole virus, not just not the spike protein of the vaccines. So I think this is what's going to take us to the end. The population will simply be so immune, it can handle this. It'll go into endemicity, be winter seasonal. And when will that happen? Every pe people always ask me this, so I update my slide and put a year later on it. So now it's, uh, <laughs> it's maybe, I don't know, but very soon, this will not be something that happens in summer anymore. It'll be a winter virus, just like uh, OC43 or seasonal flu. And then we have to worry about what should we do then? How should we control it? I think it's going to be like with autumn boosters, just like we have for seasonal flu. And then the thing to worry about really is the long COVID. And I didn't have much time to develop this here, but actually the one uh, a really characteristic of this pandemic is that some people get um, a serious sequela that lasts for a long time and can be debilitating. And how would that be in the future when we go into 10 years from now? Will there be a big log of people who are actually still struggling with this? That's a question for, for, for the Swiss Research Council to keep, uh, keep on top of long COVID. This is an important thing. Now, um, I don't have much time to talk about this, but it's not like disease X is not lurking already. We have this uh, influenza H5N1 now in a new variant, spreading, killing birds everywhere, infecting mink for the first time, spreading effectively in, effectively in mink in a mink farm in Spain, scaring uh, me uh, quite a bit uh, just here in, uh, in uh, recently. Um, it's like you could think of uh, animals like minks as a training camp for this virus. Mink live outdoors, Bird, birds fly by, uh, infect the mink, and they are like uh, the virus is in a training camp to become better at uh, spreading and become a mammal and human pathogen. So this is something mink farms is a very political issue in many countries, in their special mind. But uh, this is an, an example of how politics can meet pandemic concerns. Um, and I should say that if H5N1 was the next uh, disease X, I'd be worried also because in this study of, uh, of H5N1 cases globally up till now, uh, published in Science in 2016, it turns out if, if you get the H5 variant, um, you are likely to be born after the 1968 pandemic making uh, people in this paper and uh, uh, the commentary, which is wonderful if you want to read The First Flu Forever, is really about that something, if you're primed in your childhood by, by a, a, a virus, and these, uh, whatever you were primed with in the, before the, the uh, 1968 pandemic would have protected you against stage five, but all the young people don't have that. So totally unlike COVID, an H5 in one pandemic, I'm guessing would be more a challenge for young people. So how we remember this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and really, I think most than anything, we'll, we'll have to reckon with the fact we were ill-prepared. There was a shortage in tests. We couldn't test, test, test. We didn't have the ability. There's a shortage in protective gear. You have nurses struggling still with long COVID because they couldn't protect themselves in the early phase. If we had draconic lockdowns, we thought we were done with this in the Middle Ages or something. But no, we had this disaster in northern Italy in March 2020, which really showed us that even a modern day Denmark, uh, country can, go, can get to its knees from a virus like this. And we were super lucky. Our strategy was, was, was really uh, to wait for the vaccine to com come, and it came after eight months. That was really, really lucky. We were not good at sharing this one uh, re resource. If you look at low and middle income countries, they, their high risk populations were only vaccinated or offered the vaccine way after our low co income comp population had been offered it. So that's really an, an ugly spot and that maybe you will be speaking about, I don't know, but as we, if you look at this globally, this was not pretty. Uh, we, we remember there's a high excess mortality, a lowered life expectancy in countries like Bulgaria. The life expectancy is down many years now. And then uh, long COVID is how we will know it going forward because all of this will be forgotten soon. But the people living with long COVID, that's going to happen into the future. And that's something we just have to um, reckon with. And then I'm hoping that for all we've been through and for the historical knowledge that we have, we can prepare ourselves better for disease X. And it certainly will involve an interdisciplinary approach. Otherwise, we will not understand why some people don't want the, the vaccine when really it's there and it's the only 
anything that will keep you from from miserable meeting with the next virus. So thank you, and uh, that was it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, we have mics going around, so if there are any questions, we're happy to take them. Just maybe want to get started. Yeah. So two things that obviously stand out. Um, next to each other is that, okay, the first lesson is that they're all airborne, the yeah. pandemics. The COVID, and, the COVID. Yeah, but yeah. all the pandemics, right, you said are respiratory diseases, right, Those historically. Were the influenza pandemic, oh, I wasn't clear about this. All the influenza pandemics and influenza seasonal flu is like a short distance spread, fomite spread. Yeah. That's different with the COVID and the SARS and the MERS. They, these are airborne. Okay. Yeah. There's some emerging data also that influenza is airborne, I and then that, yeah. at the same time, right, you said we're not serious about airborne transmission. Uh, I mean, yeah. here it's not much talked about anymore. Mm -hmm. As you said, the WHO, many public health uh, agencies have taken a long time. Yeah. And these things together obviously are somewhat worrying, right? Yes. So, um, is it, what's your view on that? I mean, what's well, going on there? First of all, there? we need to just get with the program and figure out what we think about it. If you go in on the CDC's website, you'll see that influenza is a fomite-borne disease, certainly not airborne. Mm. But yet there are, there are papers like the one you mentioned out there. I think from the fact that you rarely see influenza super spreading, you can sort of reckon that it's not an airborne disease. Um, and, and so, but we need to understand all this much better. And of course, we need to understand when, once we start uh, uh, keeping the air quality clean and really maybe keeping our children away from diseases for a very long time, because we just like sterilize the environment really, can we do that? And what would happen then? Because sooner or later, you're gonna reckon with all the childhood diseases anyway. Mm. So mm. that's something that, that keeps me awake at night. What, what, what would that look like once we, will we just change the epidemiology of all the diseases, what will happen? Yeah. All right, um, do, we have, do we have questions? I have a question, yeah. Yep. Hi, Tom Peter, ETH Zurich. Thanks a Hi. lot, great talk. Question by a physicist, so I don't know much about your field. You said a pandemic eventually becomes a, a seasonal epidemic or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's the wild cat and the, the mild cat comparison. Now, influenza is also not a harmless small cat, right? And right. That's why and I, I made it a, a, a mean-looking little okay. cat, not, not just a little sweet thing. Okay, my, <laughs> my, my question is, that sounds additive. So nature invents those viruses, they all go that way, and they add up on our burden. But there must also be viruses which completely phase out. And what do we know about that? And wouldn't it be valuable to know something about that to understand how they eventually completely go away? Well, if you, if you look at uh, over time, we look at uh, three, four, five centuries over time, you will see that some uh, pandemic uh, threats definitely phased out because of uh, our um, transitioning into modern societies. So uh, uh, all, all that we've done in terms of hygiene and all of this has, has excluded us from, from a risk of a cholera pandemic or something like that. Or, so, so that, as I mean, a lot of things have helped the uh, safety of our food uh, supplies and so you don't get the foodborne diseases like we had in the past, really bad epidemics. So, um, so certain things have disappeared, but if you look at the uh, epidemic diseases like measles or anything, uh, it's all uh, thought of as childhood diseases now, but they must have been pandemics at one point, and they're still with us. I don't think they just disappear like that. The, the ones that are ill-adapted, like the SARS in 2003 and MERS in 2012, um, and even monkeypox, maybe, maybe in, in 2022, these will, will not, they don't have it yet, the full force that it will take to be maintained as endemic diseases, but the other ones will survive it. And, and, and be with us. I don't think they disappear like that. The only way they can sort of disappear is by making childhood vaccine programs. Like measles is a, long, a lifelong protection against measles that you get in childhood from the vaccine, and then you don't see it again. That's just, you're done with it. But uh, in many cases, we, we don't have those excellent vaccines options. Uh, for various reasons, you have to keep vaccinating or facing the disease again in, in old age, like, uh, like shingles, for example. Thank you. Hi, I'm here. 
No? Okay. Uh, Urs Graeber, University of Zurich. Yeah. Um, can you perhaps comment a little bit about your notion that the minks are uh, important for uh, influenza virus yeah. um, mingling and reassortment? I thought traditionally it is the uh, interplay between the pigs, the, the chicken and humans yeah. that make the reassortment very effective for yeah. new types of uh, variants and um, uh, you know, genetic yeah. hybrids of influenza virus. So why yeah. the mink now? Well, uh, thanks for saying this. I didn't really have time to go into it, but the, our, our sort of mental image of how our new pandemic virus is uh, created is what you're saying. It's the pig living with birds on the roof and, and meeting human and bird viruses can meet in the pig and they can handle both and they can uh, mix and merge and ap appear as a pandemic virus. This is how we thought about the origins of, of human uh, influenza pandemics. But now I'm, I'm thinking for Corona, it might just be uh, uh, clearly a mink could play a role. Also for these bird flu, simply because uh, pigs are nowadays kept indoors under very sterile conditions, but the mink farms, they live outdoors together with the birds, and this actually is a, is a model. It, they have an immunity, uh, immune system that is very resembling ours. They are often a, a go-to animal when we do uh, experiments in influenza. Uh, so, so why not think of them as a new mixing vessel for very much the same reasons? Okay, so it's not yet uh, super threatening. It's well, uh, it's it's, a kind it of has a happened once in Spain. Mm -hmm. I'm just waiting mm -hmm. for it to happen a thousand yeah. times on, on never again. Mm -hmm. That's then we'll know if it's important. But I think that uh, that people in the in Europe in the uh, controlling the COVID situation in minks, they should really immediately start testing for for H5N1 also and mm -hmm. be on top of this possibility because the, the the virus is all over the place and causing a, a bird pandemic right now. We can take one more question here. Marcel Weber, University of Geneva. Yeah. Um, my question is about super spreading. I found this yeah. uh, result that super spreading uh, makes uh, control via, via uh, restricting mobility uh, more effective. Yeah. Uh, would, is it also true that super spreading also makes the spread of the pandemic more difficult to predict because individual chance events can have can percolate up to to a huge effect whereas when you don't have super spreading like in the case of influenza uh, that this makes uh, predicting the pandemic uh, easier because it's uh, as it were um, more uh, even uh, in terms of uh, so chance of events happen of course yeah. but they don't have this this they don't percolate up like this without super right. spreading yeah, I think that's a good point. That I mean, if you have an early super spreading event in a say in a region in a country, you could just end up be like Lombard, Lombardy, Lombardy, the northern Italy part, that just faced this first in Europe, just because of a soccer match in in Milan, and they uh, and suddenly they had super spreading events in that context, and suddenly 50% of everybody in Bergamo city were infected with this virus before we even thought it would come to our countries. And, and so it can be very spotty. And when you see these uh, historical pandemic flu, they're sort of sweeping slowly and, and, and surely across the, the globe. Even before airplanes, they manage very well. But it's very sort of uh, like a sliding thing. So maybe it is a more like uh, stochastic this, this year. That's, that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much again. So here's a local handmade sweets, ah. uh, very <laughs> contagious, but in a good way. Thank you very much. <laughs> and yeah, please, yeah. thank you again, uh, Lona. Okay, I'm um, not sure whether the slides will change automatically or I'm expected to change them. I'll just uh, start introducing um, Semia, Semia Hurst. Uh, well, we just heard from Corona Lona, is it correct? <laughs> um, that Corona was flying uh, partly under the radar. And um, I tried now 45 minutes to, to make something out of uh, Semia's name in combination with Corona, COVID-19. But I came not up with a good good idea. But I think the analogy is quite, um, quite correct that we have, uh, from a, her perspective, certainly so many things that were also under the radar, um, that were not covered by infectious numbers and numbers of uh, vaccines and so forth. And so I'm very much looking forward to that. But let me quickly introduce uh, Semya. Semya is a, a physician uh, bioethicist. Um, well, she is not a, probably she is the 
uh, bioethicists in Switzerland, so there is uh, barely any council, committee, uh, society, editorial board, advisory group without her name on it or without her name being on it at a certain point. And often she uh, plays a central role in all these um, uh, communities. Um, at the moment, uh, and I will reduce it to that, uh, not to make it too long. She's the director of the Institute of Essex History Humanities at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Geneva. And um, I'm very much um, looking forward to her talk because um, social scientists, as I am, uh, I'm of course not only interested in all the possibilities that are there for, from a biomedical perspective, but also a question she's addressing, like uh, what health policies are most justified and why? And um, so should we always do what is technically possible? And what do we do if resources are rare and scarce? And of course, in a uh, crisis, all these questions become even more important. Um, and so we are. Uh, it's probably not a surprise that she was on the task force, the Swiss COVID task force, and it's also not a surprise that she was a vice chair there. Um, as I mentioned before, she always plays a, a central and a key role. And so she also did, in, uh, or still does, in the steering committee of the NFP80. I'm very happy to have her uh, in the steering committee. And now on stage, please welcome Sammy Hurst. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and particularly happy about the start of PNR80. When I was a young medical student, because I have a background in medicine before having another background in ethics, when I was a young medical student, in our public health classes, one of the first messages is that cultural aspects that we disregard are where public health goes to die and that humanities have to be a part of epidemic response. Now, little did I know at the time, I learned this in clinical care later on, and then in being a part of pandemic response even later on, this was actually just the first chapter of the interface between what happens in pandemics and the human and social sciences. The second part is that epidemics are a whole life impact. They impact us not just physically, they impact our biographies, they impact our communities. This is, of course, also true of diseases in general, but it is even more apparent in epidemics. And the last chapter is that um, epidemics, and in particular pandemics perhaps, also show us things about ourselves. Sometimes it's things we sort of knew before. If you ask people about what they learned, what was a real surprise, Many of the things that we learned are perhaps not entirely a surprise. And sometimes they are things that we sort of didn't like to learn. <laughs> but they are nevertheless important. Uh, a disclaimer, though this audience perhaps doesn't need it, but I like to have it there. The pandemic is not over yet. It's not over in the world. It's not even quite over in Switzerland. And anything we can see at this point is tentative. One of the purposes, indeed, of this NRP80 is to enable us to complete and revise this picture. I very much look forward to having other things on these slides in a few years' time. But let me take you back to the very first stage of this crisis chapter, this initial crisis chapter, which is now over, of the pandemic, and to this mental state in which we were in, this very particular mental state with these empty cities all over the world, and with this wave that was going up, the first wave, and we didn't know what would happen yet. You remember seeing this image going around online, probably, with very hypothetical scenarios. This is not real modeling, this is something someone drew on a piece of paper like that, your open hand drawing, of what might happen if we did nothing, or if we did a few things, or if we really did more things, and the time was, the time was then, oh, okay, it works. The time was here. And several of us at this time got a phone call or an email saying, please come tomorrow. And most people who got this email or this phone call did come tomorrow. And one of the things that, it wasn't immediate, but one of the things that happened was that Swiss pandemic response included the Swiss Science Task Force. And I want to say a few words about this because at this juncture of the 
closing event of NRP 78 and the kickoff of NRP 80, there is room to highlight an aspect of the Swiss pandemic response from a scientific standpoint, which was interdisciplinarity. This is not something that happened in every country, but the Swiss COVID-19 Science Task Force had 10 expert groups, and from the beginning, it had two of them in the human and social sciences. Many countries added on the humanities later on, not everyone did, but Switzerland had the humanities from day one. One of the groups was centered on economics, and there are several researchers who participated who are also part of projects in NRP80. Another of the group was on ethical, legal, and social issues, and there again, there are projects in NRP80 carried by researchers from this group as well. Now, a few words about the work of the Science Task Force. This was consultation, so it wasn't research. Research projects did get identified, but got earmarked for later. We had to work with the current state of knowledge and uncertainty. This was collective intelligence. We crowdsourced a lot. I'll show you a few names on the next slide. And this was interdisciplinary, which sometimes meant that things that seemed obvious to some of us had to be said nevertheless, because they were not obvious to everyone. And I'm sure all of you who have experience in interdisciplinarity know the phenomenon I'm talking about. We tend to get siloed into our own fields and imagine that many things are common knowledge when really they're not, and we have to do a lot of explaining of things that seem very basic to us. The fact that it was consultation also means that when you give data and provide advice, people don't always follow this advice. Now, we crowdsourced, as I said, and one of the things that we did was we worked through the, the Swiss National Science Foundation. I can only speak to the interfacing done in the LD group, which I headed, but there were many similar networking efforts done by the other expert groups of the task force as well. Just to give you an idea, there were up to 80 experts in the Swiss Science Task Force at any one point. A total of 93 people went through it at one point or another. The LD group, the Ethical, Legal and Social Issues group, there were five people, but through the Division One of the SNF, we got input from people working in the human and social sciences, and I just list here the names of the people who gave input in one form or another at some point or another, some a lot, others little. They are junior researchers, senior researchers in there. I counted 77 of them. This is a huge amount of people who donated time, and I want to take just a minute here, especially because this is recorded, to thank them, uh, and also to tell you if you're watching this now in this room or if you're watching the video online later, I got this list of names from the um, common documents that we used as our working tools, and I looked into my emails as much as I could, but I may have forgotten people. If I did, if you don't see your name on there and you really did give a contribution, please write me and I will add them in next iterations of this talk. But we really wished that we would have had the sort of data which the NRP80 is designed to bring to light. We really wished that we would have had the sort of information about the social and human aspects of pandemic effects that we're now going to have in the next few years. It is really important to have this PNR80. It would have been even better to have two, one during the pandemic and one after. You can't have everything, though. So this first aspect is humanities need to be a part of pandemic response. But the other aspect is pandemics affect us on a whole life basis. They are a stress test for societies, for whole societies. Epidemics, in other words, threaten our lives. It is almost trivial to say it like that, unless you understand that it means our whole lives. They threaten our physical and mental health, very obviously, but they also threaten our biographies, they threaten our connections, they threaten our identities, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and to each other about each other are fundamentally modified by epidemics. They threaten our communities. And in theory, at least, it is entirely possible to emerge from a pandemic completely physically unscathed, but having lost irreparably in these other areas. And if there is a single book out of literature that I would like to recommend you read, if you haven't yet, because by now many of you will have read it already, it is José Saramago's Blindness, where he imagines a completely made-up disease that strikes people with blindness. And I'm going to spoil a little bit, so 
move ahead five or 10 seconds if you're watching this online, if you want to read it and haven't yet. In the end, people recover. But in the interval, while they were blind, the whole society unravels. And it is not clear at the end of the book how it can ever stand up again. So this is the imagination exercise of societal impacts of an epidemic that ends up not directly killing anyone. This effect on the rest of our lives. And of course, these risks are not evenly distributed. We do not have the same means to survive and defend ourselves in such a situation. And this means that very predictably, there will be an uneven distribution of all of these risks. Pandemics are also situations where we must do things together on a more demanding scale than is usually the case. Cooperation is a human superpower. We are able to do together quite astonishing things that none of us would be able to do on our own. But the demandingness of this cooperation in a pandemic situation becomes greater. This is why it shows us where we are able to rise to the occasion and where we are not. It shows us our strengths and our weaknesses. It demands more of us. And one of the things that it demands more of in particularly difficult circumstances is trust. Trust, which is the ingredient of cooperation. Trust becomes greater, the need for trust becomes greater in a crisis, but at the same time, it is also more threatened. It becomes more fragile. If we feel anxious, precarious, under threat, trust is harder. We tend to focus on a smaller circle. Actually, in Switzerland, this focusing on a smaller circle of people was sometimes protective. You may have noticed there were times when it looked like the virus did not jump language barriers, as if there was a physical barrier between the language regions. Sociologists told us at the time that the most likely hypothesis was that when people moved into their inner circle and stopped seeing people in their outer circle, very few people have a bilingual inner circle. We tend to live next to each other and interact on the outer circles between language groups in Switzerland, but if you focus on your inner circle, it's likely to only speak one language, and this made sometimes, for, for a time, the, the language frontiers um, tight to the virus to some degree. But, so trust becomes harder and more important, and trust rests on representations and expectations. And it's important to understand this because representations and expectations can be mistaken, and so trust can be mistaken, and this can further endanger it. One of the first pieces I wrote during the pandemic was a blog piece in the Journal of Medical Ethics called Accepting Trust for Pandemic Response. We need leaders to think twice. And this piece was inspired by very important and clarifying work on trust done by a British philosopher. Dame Honora O'Neill has one of the most influential accounts of trust currently published. And on her account, trust is never entirely blind nor entirely given. We trust, she explains, if we believe that a person or a group will do a specific thing in a manner that is competent, reliable, and honest. And this means that we can trust for very precise things and not for others. Trust, in other words, is often misunderstood. It's not about liking someone. You can like someone and distrust them. You can not particularly like someone and trust them. Trust does not have to be reciprocal either. I trust you, why don't you trust me, is a sign of misunderstanding. I am married to a surgeon. I would trust him to operate on my appendix, but he would be very, very foolhardy to trust me to do the same to him. I do not know how to do this, right? So trust does not have to be reciprocal. And this means, of course, that in order to know if you're going to deserve trust, you have to know what is expected of you. And if things are expected of you which you do not know, and which you do not explain you can't do, you will inevitably betray trust. Physicians know this. We have patients who come to see us with an implicit expectation that we will be able to make them immortal. They never say it in so many words, of course, but the expectation is whatever happens, you'll be able to save my life, right? And that is the same as thinking we can make them immortal. And we can't. And if we don't explain this, we, if we accept this trust, of course, we will betray it. You have to know what is expected of you. So what was expected 
And what were legitimate expectations in pandemic response? This is an interesting question. And the first shot at it, but it's only a first shot, is that governments made a contract, usually implicitly with us, with the population, where they asked us to make sacrifices, take on burdens, make choices we would not have made otherwise, face risks. And in return, they committed themselves as far as they could, because you can never commit yourself to more than that as far as they could to protect our health, that was the visible part, but also to protect our rights and to protect our subsistence, to provide a sort of bridge to the other side. So if we look at these different chapters, we can examine the different aspects and how it played out with the human and social sciences on each one. The first slide on this series I will go quickly over. You have seen these numbers. Switzerland didn't do too badly in terms of deaths, but I checked, of course, Denmark did do a little bit better. Um, and, but on, the, on distribution, there was a social stratification. This is something that was shown in country after country after country. You did not run the same risks of becoming ill or dying, even on this very simple outcome measure, uh, depending on what socioeconomic group you belonged to, not just age. Age is a factor, of course, but also how well off you were. Now, this is with the usual way of looking at socioeconomic factors, but very early on in the pandemic, there was quite a forward-looking paper written by an economist in the US, Robert Reich, who wrote a journal uh, article called Pandem COVID-19 Pandemic Shines a Light on a New Kind of Class Divide and Its Inequalities. And he describes four groups, which he describes as follows. The first is the remote, sorry for the typo, those who are able to telework, to batten down the hatches, stay at home, they'll be stressed out, bored or anxious with kids out of school, but he says they're well off compared to the other three classes. The second one is the essentials, people who can't stay home, who must work in the face of danger, often without personal protective equipment at the beginning. And he says of them, too many essentials lack adequate protective gear, paid sick leave, health insurance, childcare, especially important if schools are closed, and they also deserve hazard pay. A moment to pause here. We are now at the time when many of the people who became ill in the course of essential work, and some of them remained ill, are now losing their jobs. Right. So this is another situation that is an effect that is lowered, that is further down the line, what, that we have to be attentive to. The third group is the unpaid, the resulting desperation of those who lose their pay during the pandemic because they did not get support from their governments where they live, because they cannot work. This is what is fueling demand to reopen the economy long before it's safe. And it also comes down to a choice between risking one's health and putting food on the table, and many will take the latter. So it also drives uh, unofficial work, and people will then take risks of becoming infected in order to not run the risk of becoming destitute. And the fourth group he calls the forgotten. These are people who are institutionalized, unable to socially distance, or who live on the streets. All such places, he says, are becoming hotspots for the virus. These people need safe spaces with proper medical care, adequate social distancing, testing, isolation of those who have contracted it, and few are getting any of this. So this is about protecting health and protecting rights. And the next chapter also is about this because, of course, when you have a lot of need in terms of healthcare at the same time, you get into issues of resource allocation. And this happened to be one of the topics I had been working on for 20 years before the pandemic ever hit. And so I was part of the group that wrote the guidelines on triage in intensive care for the Swiss Academy of Medical Sciences because you need to have worked on something for 20 years in order to write a draft within a week. And that's what we did with the initial draft before it went out for consultation. There's a lot of stuff in these, uh, in these directives, and they have been revised four times during the first crisis stage of the pandemic with it really substantial improvements every time. But ethically, it comes down to doing as much good as possible, at the same time recognizing the equal value of all persons and protecting professionals. Now, how did it work in practice? What we found out in this mirror of the pandemic is that speaking about fair allocation is something we know how to do. 
But then how do we do, how do we apply it? And one thing we found out is we do not dare to say that we are applying it. This is a figure out of one of the policy briefs of the Swiss National Science Task Force that looked at the second wave in 2020. And here you have the first green line is the projected number of hospitalizations based on the projected number of hospitalizations per case that was happening. And the second green line is people who actually were admitted to intensive care. So there's a big gap here. And this was being followed in real time. This was not projected cases. This was real life cases and projected hospitalizations. So there are different hypotheses to explain this. Maybe there was improvement in treatment and people didn't need hospitalization that much. Well, no, because then we should have had a decrease in mortality and we did not have that. Or maybe there was a shift in the age distribution of cases and people who were sick were younger and needed less admission to hospital. But actually, no, it was the opposite. There was an increased mortality pointing to older patients than in the first wave. And actually, the most likely hypothesis is that informal triage took place. And at no point in the pandemic was there ever an official hand raise and say, now we have to use these directives. They were never used officially. But it, the data looks very much like at some stage, perhaps not even in intensive care itself, right? Perhaps uphill at hospital admission, uh, some form of, of limitation happened. Another thing we learned, but or perhaps just confirmed, is that we are, in our organizations, a work-centric society. One of the things that we heard a lot was, well, we are confining for the old. And it's implied that elderly people were the beneficiaries and the others sacrificed. But if you look closer, a more complicated picture emerges. In fact, our social organizations exist to, and to protect us, to enable us, to enable us to make certain choices, to exercise certain rights, to live our lives without having to risk them too much. And COVID-19 changed the circumstances, and temporarily, to continue having the same goods out of our social organizations, we had to reorganize our organizations. But actually, reorganizations focus first and foremost on the working population. In the different spheres of society, professional activities got the first focus and priority for reorganization. Family life, the commons, associations, all the rest, came second and sometimes not at all. We focus far more on the working population on the, than on the young, the elderly, and now the immunosuppressed. We reorganize the functioning workplaces and not access to the components of life for everyone. And that was a very important fact. We also learned or confirmed that we are an ableist society. We entered the crisis stage with very little accommodation for people living with disabilities and even with many other disadvantages. And actually, when we exited, I have a postdoc who is doing a study now on the experiences of the pandemic among people who are blind. And one of the first things that her participants told her is, when are they going to start helping me on the bus again? Uh, every measure is ended now, right? So we should have gone back to normal. But it seems that instead of going back to normal, in many instances, we came back to easy. And it is not the same thing. Now, this focus on work meant that there was a little sentence that many governments, government representatives said at the end of the first wave, at the end when we deconfined. And um, the science task force made out of this little sentence its only scientific publication in a, in a journal of the first phase of the pandemic. And this little sentence was, we can all go back to our lives, but of course, the vulnerable have to stay confined. And we thought, well, how long? And what does it mean, right? And how is that really protective? And we wrote first a policy brief, then an article on continued confinement of those most vulnerable to COVID-19, where we outline all the different aspects of the implications of this little sentence that went mostly uncommented otherwise. Um, now, when we speak about allocating our efforts, we speak about allocating hospital beds, we also have to speak about allocating vaccines. Countries usually had very nice vaccination allocation procedures within their country. It was different from one country to the other, but there was always a reason why, and it was explained, and it was transparent. Of course, on the world stage, things looked very different. On the world stage, put bluntly, countries did not share. And although we have to say there was more sharing in this pandemic than in previous ones, the margin of progress is still immense. 
And this is one of the things we have to learn out of this, is that we need to do better on the chapter of international cooperation. It's important as well because cooperation is also about reciprocity. In 2009, there was a beginning of an outbreak of influenza in Thailand, and because of issues of international resource allocation, at one point, the Thai government stopped sending samples to WHO because they did not have guarantees that they would then get a vaccine if it was developed and needed for their own population. We need international cooperation for pandemic surveillance and awareness and early reaction, and so we have to have it on all levels, because otherwise, why cooperate if the system you're cooperating into will do nothing for you in return? On the chapter of protecting rights, I also have to say that Switzerland got two points, two black points, <laughs> uh, from Amnesty International, one on the rights of refugees and asylum seekers, uh, where exceptional circumstances often meant that they had a harder time or an even harder time than usual. And also during the first wave, there was one point at the start of the pandemic where I'm going to cite, the police lacked clear guidelines to implement emergency measures and disproportionately limited protesters' right to freedom of peaceful assembly by imposing blanket bans on demonstration in public and handing out fines in certain cantons. This was only initially. In the next waves, even when we had restrictions, there was always an exception for peaceful demonstration. But here you have an example in April of 2020 where demonstrators in Tel Aviv showed the planet that you could do a COVID-safe demonstration by filling up the entire city at two meters distance from one another. And here you have in June, after the initial ban was lifted in June in Geneva, this was actually a Black Lives Matter demonstration where people basically hadn't gotten the memo about social distancing, although many people are wearing masks, as you can see on the picture. When you speak of protecting rights, of course, it's about, pro it's about protecting rights, but it's also sometimes about balancing them, because you have different rights at the same time, and they're not always compatible. You want to protect different components of people's good, protect the other values at stake. It doesn't always fit. Components of the good for different people are not compatible, and people want and understand different things and have rights that are in tension with one another. So how do you do that? This is, this is one of the ethically fascinating things. First lesson, recognize the dilemma. If you have an important goal, which it would be a transgression not to aim for, and in order to aim for that goal, you need a restriction, which is also a transgression, you have to face it head on. Many people just don't like being in a dilemma and will try to deny the first point or to deny the second one or to deny both. Say the goal is not that important or say it's not really a transgression. Well, no, the goal is important and it really is a transgression. And there are rules rules that are reminded, of, of which we're reminded by the lawyers, there are legal rules, actually, for when you can transgress a right. Usually, they are described as three principles, necessity, subsidiarity, and proportionality. And the second message is that in these principles, facts and values are inextricably intertwined. And that is one of the reasons why you get sometimes chaotic discussions, because some of the elements of these principles can be observed, right? Is the goal reachable? Is the means likely to reach it, etc.? But some of them are value judgments. Is it an important goal? What is the degree of this restriction? And here you need to see that science has a very important place in the green bits, but not in the purple bits. This is about evaluation. Uh, another aspect is bringing us to the other side. Uh, I will not dwell on this, others could speak to this much better than I could, but in a nutshell, health and the economy are much more interwoven than people usually think. A lot of the news media like to portray the discussions about pandemic measures, about a fight between health and the economy, but actually, if you don't do anything, the economy suffers a lot as well. And another aspect is that you have collective action problems everywhere. Uh, you have a public good, which is low case numbers, uh, an intact healthcare system. It's a non-rival good, so used by one does not limit use by the others, and you can't exclude anyone. So someone who doesn't wear a mask or doesn't have a vaccine also benefits from the low case numbers. And then you have situations where everyone needs to do their part for this good to be achieved, and everybody has to sort of think about whether the other ones are going to do their part because maybe doing my part on my own is not worth it if the others are not doing it too. Should I close bars in my canton if the next canton over is going to have them open? Should I wear a mask on the bus? 
In Geneva, we had a public survey in summer of 2020 where 80% of Genovese said there should be a mandatory use of masks on buses. But on the buses, you could observe every day that nobody was wearing a mask. And people said, these people are irrational. No, they have correctly understood the collective action problem. If you are on your own wearing a mask, your protection is not all that great. And uh, you get strange looks from everyone. So the cost is high and the benefit is low. If everybody else is also wearing a mask, your benefit is high and the cost is low because you're not getting all these strange looks from everyone. Should I keep my sick child at home, etc.? And perhaps the most challenging aspect of bringing us to the other side has to do with living with our disagreements. This is one of the task force policy briefs on uh, responses to corona denial, where we very uh, strongly highlighted the importance of keeping even very seemingly irrational discourses within the, the democratic discussion, of not demonizing them. And here I want to point you to very important work, in my view, of the political philosopher Teresa Bejan in the UK, who has as her work focus this art of discussion in this very disagreeable experience we all must live with, of living with people who disagree with us, if we want to live in pluralist societies. Because this is what pluralist societies are, places where people disagree with each other. And in order to remain members of the same society, we have to learn this art of stating our positions, but not making it impossible for future interactions to happen. In conclusions then, pandemics are mirrors. They show us our strengths, they show us our weaknesses, they show us our values, and sometimes these values don't fit together, so they show us where they don't fit together, and because we must arbitrate, they show us our priorities. This was a, an article in the international press, Switzerland is choosing austerity over life. And this is one of the things that we saw, right? There were times when uh, money counted and there were times when health counted. There were times when both were aligned and when they became disaligned, it was a bit of a struggle sometimes. Uh, they show us our priorities. And these can be difficult lessons to learn, but they are important. They are particularly important if they also allow us to learn out of our strengths and out of what we were able to do during such a time of crisis. This is why I have this picture of the Japanese art of mending things with gold to make an object that is then more precious than the initial one before it was broken. This is one of the hopes out of this PNR 80. This is why we are here. I look forward to seeing the results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samia. We, um, again, take some time for questions. There are uh, mics going around, and I uh, will give it a start. Uh, you mentioned that um, five out of 83 persons uh, in, the, in the task force uh, and, and the working yeah. groups were from in the ELSI group. Yeah. Um, and you try to make it sound positive mm -hmm. that uh, in Switzerland we had this, uh, um, this perspective in the task force. Um, but we could uh, um, also say, well, five out of so many, isn't that too little? Yeah, you could say that, but actually this was about the average size of every group. And you had a public health group that was also about the same number. And you had the ones doing the modeling that were also about the same number. And as I showed, we were not just us. Uh, the point of the science task force was to be an interface with the Swiss scientific community. Now, every group dealt with this part of our mandate differently, but in the ethical, legal and social issues group, we were very much an interface. What we did um, is that, and, and this was largely through the help of the Swiss National Science Foundation, I have to say. Uh, di the Division I leadership was on board from day one, and they would send out the questions that we were working on to all the researchers funded through Division I. And these were people whom none of us necessarily knew. So of course we knew some of them, Switzerland is not that big, but there were also people who showed up in the shared documents that we had not heard of. We should, of course, but we hadn't, and whom we would not have called on our own. So this was a, f a functioning interface that was very broad. And we also asked them to let it be known among the researchers that if they had issues that were not being addressed by the science task force and which they thought should be, 
to contact us through the same channels. And this actually happened on a few occasions. So not all of them led to published policy briefs, although some of them did, because what would happen then is we would have a chat with the researchers who'd raise their hands, see how we could bring this forward. Um, and sometimes in the discussion, uh, it actually turned out that there wasn't that much. So for example, we had one such discussion where when someone raised their hand and said, we have to say something about um, honoring the dead. I said, sure, that's a very important part of it. So we had the chat and we asked, well, what do you think we should be saying? What, what should be the main messages here? And actually, um, this person needed to think more <laughs> and it ended up never happening. But there were also people who raised their hand and said, we have to say something about visits in nursing homes. And this led to a document. Someone said, we have to say something about gender and this led to a publication as well. So we didn't have all the ideas ourselves. We had dozens and dozens of people who contributed. One thing I didn't mention is out of the 77 names on the slide, nine were actually not based in Switzerland. Right? So we also had uh, freely given international help uh, from people working in the, in the social and human, in human sciences. And that was quite uh, impressive. So the mics arrived already at Person? Yes, please. Go on on. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I wish we had had someone like you in the debate in Denmark. It's really a fantastic point of view you have. Um, I was wondering if you would, um, have you thought about the, the, this business of proportionality? It's something I found was really hard to make people understand this year. A pandemic is a completely different thing than seat belts and secondhand smoke. This is something if we don't do certain things, some things will go really bad. Yeah. like in northern Italy, or uh, what the model said. And people had a hard time understanding that proportionality is not just what's right here, right now, it's also what's to come in two months if we don't yeah. do something. That's a very important comment. Thank you. So the proportionality is the final criteria. So necessity is that you have an important goal, and of course you have to explain what the goal is. Right? If you don't do that, the thing never gets off the ground. You have to explain what the goal is, and then there has to be some form of decision that this is an important enough goal to pursue in the first place. Because if it's not, you stop there. Then you have subsidiarity, which means you have to choose the least burdensome approach that is likely to give you the goal you want. And here you have to examine possible approaches, which ones are realistic, which ones could be carried out, which ones could not, which ones are likely to be effective, which ones are not. And then you choose the one that is the least burdensome, but here again you have a va an evaluation because burden, you already have some disagreement among reasonable people as to what is most burdensome. And then if you have necessity and you have subsidiarity, it's not enough. You must also have proportionality. It must be worth it. The benefit, the goal must be worth the burden. And this is the mother of all battles. This is something that you're going to predictably have disagreements among reasonable people about. Right? It's, and it, the important thing to understand is proportionality is not about whether or not the measure is frustrating. The fact that the measure is frustrating is a given because you're in a dilemma, right? There's going to be a sacrifice. You would not even start this reasoning if you had only things everybody wanted to do in the first place. It is because there is frustration that you are going, and not just frustration, but actual transgression, that you are going to be having this reasoning in the first place. Proportionality is whether it balances out. And you will have disagreement about that, inevitably. So you can't expect that a measure will be viewed as proportionate by everyone. What you can expect, however, is that the decision about whether or not it's proportionate is made in a way that makes it understandable for everyone, and that there are measures to, that there are possibilities of voicing disagreement. That's one of the reasons why having the possibility of political demonstration is so crucial, right? And indeed, they did happen in Switzerland. Um, but we also had two votes during uh, the first crisis stage, two direct popular votes on COVID measures, where in both cases the population voted yes, right? So there's all, th all sorts of things about decision mechanisms and legitimacy and democracy that get uh, invited into the discussion at this proportionality stage, but that is because you can't expect to have complete agreement. And if you, if you have a requirement for complete agreement, you basically veto everything, right? <laughs> thank, 
Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm a physician, I'm a clinician, and I think I was exposed to this informal triage, uh, triage in, uh, during the second wave. And my question is the following. What do you think about that in terms of uh, regional variation or I mean, who paid the price of yeah. this informal triage? Do we know that? Can we know that? So there could be many questions in your question. Um, one of the reasons why the Swiss Academy wanted the guidelines on triage was to support a fair distribution. The fact that it happened informally, at least that the data strongly suggests that it happened informally, does not mean that it necessarily happened unfairly. What it means, however, is that it was intransparent, and so it is difficult to know whether or not it was fair, right? So this is a risk, a more risk situation than if it was transparent and documented. Another reason was that we wanted to avoid too much regional variation, and informal triage is open to regional variation because you, you are not doing this officially, so you don't know what thresholds are being applied in different parts of the country. Another reason was that um, without such guidelines, healthcare providers would have been left on the front lines to invent it themselves. And this is not just a risk of error in terms of fairness, it is also an immense burden. Uh, and this was to be avoided, right? So our hope, at least my hope, is that the existence of these guidelines were helpful even if they were not officially applied because it was at least a, a reference document that was usable even if there was never a sort of green light for its use. But there was certainly a burden, a moral burden, borne by healthcare providers who were doing this in the front lines. And although we can hope that the existence of the guidelines diminished that burden, it is naive to think that it would have taken it away. Uh, this is something that is also being measured, right? There are people working on moral distress in healthcare providers uh, as a factor of burnout, as a factor of psychological distress, and this is a very well-known and studied phenomenon. So yes, I, I take it you were not speaking of financial cost, um, but there is a great non-financial cost on, of these situations, yeah. Okay, yep, thank you. Uh, you mentioned reciprocity. Yeah. Uh, and gave that example of Thailand, and it makes immediate sense, but we have the lack of reciprocity in so many parts, uh, also when it comes to the climate discussion and so yeah. on. How would you establish it? Well, it's, this is a very good question. Um, you, you have to want to establish it first. And even when you do want to establish it, it's not easy. Usually people start very small, right? Because you want to, you also are establishing trustworthiness, right? We'll take an, a small engagement, show that it works, and then we build from there. But you have to first have the will to do it. And of course, it's difficult to tell sometimes how much will to do it there is on the international stage. There seems to be at least some, right? It's not zero. Uh, you can also take the optimistic view, as I did, that it's improving, because if you look at the way that sharing was done in previous pandemics, uh, the measures that were taken internationally for sharing this time are actually a hope, right? They're going in the right direction, but there is, a lot of, uh, there is still a lot of, of work to be done there. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, one last question. It's very bright. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I wanted also to come back uh, to the triage question. Is it also possible that actually the patients would be suggested to, to triage themselves out by these patient wills and willings that were, um, it seems, increasing also uh, yeah. during the pandemic? Okay, so this is a really good question. Uh, it is true that one of the things you absolutely do not want at a time of resource scarcity in a big pandemic wave is to fill up intensive care with patients who do not want to be there. Right? That's one of the things you absolutely want to avoid. So it's important to have discussions and see who wants or does not want intensive care in case of life-threatening acute disease. And so, yes, it's, there, was also, there were also statements from many different parties about, um, about mainstreaming advanced care planning, about making this part of everyday medicine much more, even more than it is today. Uh, this, however, leads to documentation. So if, indeed, it is the rise of advanced care planning that has led to this discrepancy in the curves, 
you should be able to document that through the fact that the number of missing people in intensive care is actually comparable to the number of people who did the advanced care planning thing. So that's actually something that is not known currently, but that is theoretically knowable. Right? You could go back to the patient files and look at advanced care planning. One thing you cannot do, however, is, um, is document every single instance where someone did not call. Right? Uh, some of the people must have been at home at first, right? and so maybe people just didn't call. And there you can't know why. Right? You can even imagine that some people had this reaction we sometimes see in geriatric medicine, that when, um, when there is too much speaking about things like that, you get old people saying, okay, so I'll just leave it for the young. And they don't necessarily say that out loud, they don't necessarily document it. And of course, there's interesting discussions to be had as to whether this is an expression of self-determination or whether it is actually social pressure exercising itself on a vulnerable group, and maybe it's both, right? Thank you. Um, I'm having, you're having a short question, short answer? Okay. I'll try to do a short answer. <laughs> Just, uh, just as an addendum to that, there might be multiple layers, and I'd like to know if there are data to examine what happens in an ER. Right, so once you are in the ER, uh, I'm a pediatrician by training, but uh, I see a lot of bias in terms of who gets admitted, who doesn't. We've done some work yeah. long before the pandemic, uh, had a 6,000 children cohort uh, mm -hmm. with kids of, with uh, flu-like illness and respiratory infections. Yeah. And who is getting diagnosed, who gets a diagnostic test, and who is getting admitted is not purely linked to disease yeah. severity. There, is, yeah. there, is, there are other factors. Yeah, so exactly. That's, that's exactly the kind of phenomenon I was pointing to when I said there was informal triage that was taking place and perhaps not in the intensive care itself. Intensive care specialists are used to doing triage on a... On a less hot level um, every day, right? And they are used to documenting it and it is part of their expertise and experience. Outside, perhaps not so much. And so uh, if there was no triage at the entrance of intensive care itself, and we have this discrepancy in the two curves, it means it must have happened at some other point in the health system. And of course, the first hypothesis that springs to mind is not its patients self-selecting out. It's that at some other point, there is some bias in the referrals. And of course, the emergency room could be one of these points. It's, it's completely plausible, yes. Well, um, thank you. I think all the questions uh, show that it's great that we, this is not a closing yeah. uh, remark <laughs> of the conference and we have plenty of time to continue conversation, thank ask questions, discuss uh, the topics. Thank you very much, uh, Samir, for your thank presentation. You. And hold on. Hold on. Um, of, of course, you know the quote uh, from Forrest Gump, life is like a box of chocolate, you never know what you're going to get. Uh, in this case, it's also a box of chocolate for us because we don't know what you get. Oh, I see. Um, <laughs> at least I do not know because when we um, uh, did research on what is the speciality of tune, we were uh, told it is tune fish. But uh, when you Google tune fish, you get a lot of pictures of tuna. And uh, I, well, I, I assume it's not tuna in there. Thank uh, you. I was told there are some sweets in there. Enjoy. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now we have a, a coffee break until quarter past. Afterwards, we'll go into parallel sessions. We have three parallel sessions. And most of you already have uh, registered, signed up for one of the Three, uh, for those who have not, please uh, choose one. Um, we have all three parallel sessions are on the main overarching question of uh, scientific challenges during a crisis to reflect on our work. And we do it in different formats with uh, a discussion, with um, a World Cafe, with a podium. And uh, so the sessions A, there are in a and C, they're both in the Lachen Saal. So for, for those of the NRP 80 who have stayed here in the, yesterday, uh, it's just um, uh, along the hallway and then in the other part of the building, there are two rooms. Oh, it's uh, written down here, perfect. And uh, uh, B will um, happen here. So enjoy your coffee and see you uh, back then. Thank you. <laughs>